Welcome back. We are here with Eileen Haas. We're talking about her book, Along Came a Stroke, something that I'm sure many of us can relate to, whether it's happened to us or someone we know and love, know or love. But her book tells the story from the moment that her stroke occurred through her subsequent hospitalization and rehab and beyond. And Eileen tells it with humor and grit, and we're just going to bring her on and let her tell the story because Eileen, thank you so much for coming to share with us and what a great opportunity to share your experience. Thank you so much, Lauren, for having me. We're so excited to have you. And I definitely believe that more of us need to understand stroke, know about stroke. And from your experience, we can learn a lot. So why don't you tell us a little bit about how, how it happened to you? Well, first of all, it comes out of the blue, like, you are going about your business, not expecting anything to happen, and boom. Uh, it's like you, you really, most people don't know what's happening. I did. Most people do not. But um, I thought that was it. I was going to die. And, you know, the amazing thing was that although I was way too young to uh, end it all, I thought, that's okay. It's all right. But at the same time, I did everything I could to stay alive. So how, and, how old were you? I was 61. And what were you doing at the time that this occurred? Folding laundry. <laughs> I mean, how much more mundane can you get than folding laundry? It's like just, it was a beautiful Saturday morning. The sun was out. It was cool, but not too cool. It really was a perfect day. And I had all kinds of plants which went out the window, I can tell you. But um, I was folding laundry and I had a stroke. I felt something in the back of my neck. And I had the worst headache of my life, which I found out is pretty normal. Okay. And um, I remember I couldn't see out of one eye. And I, I knew I... I don't know how I knew, but I knew I was having a stroke. And uh, you go into action, except you cannot, your body will not obey the commands it normally obeys. So I had to get to a phone. I didn't have my phone on me. Now I have it at all times. I have it right here. Right. I take it to the bath, the room. I take it everywhere. So I, but at the time, I didn't have my phone. So I had to get to my landline, which was three or four feet away. Those three or four feet felt like three or four miles. It's like your body doesn't want to move. Um, different things happen to different people. I was so dizzy. I lost my sense of balance. Mm -hmm. So I finally got to the phone and I could only remember one phone number. And it was that of a friend who miraculously answered. Wow. And I knew, also knew she had a key to my house. So she let herself in, ran up the stairs, took one look at me and called 911. That's kind of how it happened. And even though I hope it never happens to any of your listeners, you need to be prepared for just in case it does. 
So in our in that case, um, why would you not call 911 right away? I couldn't remember 911. It's like everyone thinks it's so ingrained in you. Like you will call you if you forget everything, you'll remember 911. I did not. Wow. I did I it never occurred to me to dial 911. Which I Which, think is an amazing point to make because everyone, like you said, believes it's so ingrained. Yeah. They've done a great job with understanding. But if you can't recall that information, what can you recall? And you were very fortunate. I was very lucky. I was very lucky. But that's why I say have the phone with you at all times, because 20 seconds earlier, I, I would have acted differently. I would have had more presence of mind. It's amazing how a few seconds can make the difference, but it does. It really the, the difference of the time for, to get to the landline. So from the time the stroke occurred until you got to the landline. It was half a minute. I am guessing. I understand. So what? But I I, I had to, I had to cross the bed. <laughs> that was a problem. Yeah. So what made you write the book? Um, people who have strokes have a lot of questions and a lot of concerns and uh, a lot of things that really are not right, but um, they don't ask anyone because no one knows except another person who's had a stroke. So I felt like I was kind of an expert, even though everyone is different and everyone loses different abilities. Um, I felt that I really could commiserate with people who have had a stroke or another life-threatening illness. Um, and once you've had it, you kind of know what you should have done. So you tell people, and I want everyone who's had a stroke or other life-threatening illness to know there is a life afterwards, and it can be really good. Uh, you just have to have a certain attitude, and that's why I wrote the book. So that's wonderful, and I think that's true for so many aspects of our lives, that we learn from other people's stories, sure. and certainly will learn from from your encouragement and the understanding that any life-changing event requires a different way of thinking going forward. So how how has it changed for you? What have you been able to do to create this new life for yourself? Well, for one thing, you have to really think about what your abilities are and your talents and what you can still do and I was fortunate in that I can write until my brain is is not working anymore. I can write. I can find a way to write. That's what I do. Uh, I couldn't hold down a job uh, for the first year. I thought, oh, I'm going back. I never went back. Yeah, I, it was so many years before I could have gone back that I, at that time I had let it go. So uh, you have to think about what you still can do and you have to do everything you can possibly do to make yourself better. And you have to accept that your life is not going to be worse. It's going to be different but it's not necessarily going to be worse. In some cases, it may be better. <laughs> you know, uh, for me, it was better. I got the courage 
to do what I could never do. I could never quit my job and write. Wow. But having had a stroke, uh, I, it wasn't a question of quitting my job. My job quit me, but I could still write and I could write as much or as little as I wanted and there was no one to tell me otherwise. <laughs> and so what have you found now? I'm, I'm understanding that speech was a challenge for you in the beginning, yeah. but the fact that you could get your words out in written form has become really important. Did you, yeah. did you ever want to write a book before? Yes, I did. I, I never took it that seriously. It was one of those, oh, one day I'll do that. Well, um, you know, one day came. <laughs> <laughs> one day, I didn't ask for it. It just came. So I chose to see it as a blessing. I got my one day. And uh, if I could do nothing else, I could write a book. So I did. So I find it very interesting that now you've written a book, but you are asked more times than not to talk about the book because, yes. because now you can you can actually have a way to share your story in multiple ways. How has that how has that evolved into your new life now? Well, um, writing the book was definitely easier than talking about it, as you can hear. But it has forced me to talk more and talk longer. And, you know, I, I had a really inexperienced speech therapist. So I am planning to go to someone who knows what they are doing. And hopefully I will sound better because my comprehension is fine. Uh, I, I understand everything um, and I know what I should be saying, but it doesn't always come out that way. But it's getting better. Slowly, 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 it's getting better. So what other, what other advice do you have for our viewers, your readers, people who have either experienced themselves a serious life-threatening trauma or kind of a preparation for, you know, this could happen? Well, for one thing, don't beat yourself up. Be good to yourself. You can and focus on what you can still do. Um, one of the things that helped me a lot, I love to bake. So, uh, you know, I, I shake on one side, although it's gotten a lot better, but um, I could still bake with one hand, except for measuring out vanilla. I still have trouble with that. But, um, you know, I could still bake cakes and cookies and all the good stuff, and that made me feel so good. So I would say to people, concentrate on what you still can do and do it. Do it, do it, do it. You will get better at it. And certain things that you think you can never do, you'll surprise yourself. You will be able to do it. Maybe not as well as you used to, but you'll be able to do it. And uh, you will feel so proud of yourself for doing that. It will feel really good. I think it's really important that your message continues to encourage people to celebrate every victory, celebrate yes. everything that you can and do do in your process. Yes, so true. And, you know, it sounds a little bit corny, maybe, but, you know, when people say to you, oh, you sound so much better or oh, I noticed you're using that side. Oh, you feel so good. And so it's important for the people around you to constantly encourage you 
and every little thing they notice that's better, they should tell you about it and get all excited because you will. And you feel, oh, yeah, maybe I sound better today. Or maybe I sound better in general. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> and you really probably do. You just don't recognize it in yourself. I think that's important to know. And I love that you want to encourage people around you to encourage and acknowledge every improvement, because a lot of times we just don't want to talk about it. We want it to just kind of be in the background. But the truth is, even without a trauma, encouragement works. It really does. And I have to put in a little plug here. You know, disabled people used to be locked up in an attic somewhere and the family took care of them, but didn't want anyone else to see them. I notice now, uh, thankfully those days are over, but I notice now that when people are in wheelchairs and I smile at them and talk to them, oh, they are so happy that someone recognized their existence, didn't look the other way, um, treated them like a human being, um, it makes such a difference, such a difference. So the next time you encounter a disabled person, if you are not disabled yourself, say hello to them. Smile at them. It really doesn't take much to make them feel really good about themselves. That's great advice. Eileen, tell me, how can our viewers find your book? Where can they purchase it? Where can they see more about it? Well, of course, they can go to Amazon. Uh, Amazon has everything and it has my book. It's also been distributed to Barnes and Noble. And I'm trying to get into local bookstores. Okay. Uh, the Pacific Northwest, which doesn't help people elsewhere, but um, Hopefully, as Tom goes by, more and more people will pick it up. And I know that you're published with Bold Story Press, and I'm sure yeah. they can find it on the Bold Story Press website as well. Eileen, thank you so much for coming to share with us. I hope people will look for uh, look for your book, Along Came a Stroke, and take away the learning and your humor and your sweetness in sharing what could have been really a horror and I'm sure was, but you've turned it into a blessing. And that's something we all need to know. Thank you so much, Lauren. It's a pleasure and we'll talk to you again and we'll be right back. Mm -hmm.